Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Gents. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 114 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we talk with Emily Emmerich, Executive Director of Ledoux Topiary Gardens, about the art of topiary and the over 100 topiaries on the 22 acres of Ledoux's grounds. The plant profile is on nasturtium, and we share what's going on in the garden, as well as some upcoming local gardening events. This week on the Garden DC podcast, we're joined by Emily Emmerich. She is the Executive Director of Ledoux Topiary Gardens in Moncton, Maryland. Welcome, Emily. Thank you, Kathy. How are you? Good. How are you doing? We were just talking pre-show taping about how hot this summer was, so I guess our answer should be hot, right? (laughs) Exactly. You know what? Right now at this moment, it's a little cloudy, and um, I've never appreciated clouds quite as much as I have this summer. It's been brutal. Mm -hmm. I 100% agree. The overcast, just keeping it from one or two degrees cooler has in any day has just been a blessing and the shade has never been more valued and shade gardening. So the topic we're going to mostly address today in this recording is the art of topiary and all the wonderful things about growing topiary in your own home garden and what they can experience at Ledoux Topiary Gardens. But we want to start off first learning a little bit about you, Emily, and were you born with chlorophyll in your veins and a green thumb? Huh. Maybe the chlorophyll, <laughs> no, not the green thumb. Ah. I was not, I was uh, very fortunate to grow up in a pseudo suburban area with a lot of neighbors who were great gardeners, different interests. There was sort of a formal box hedge, herb and vegetable and flower garden on one side of me. And then a gentleman who had an Asian inspired garden with water features. I didn't know any of those things when I was a child. I was just running through them and probably disrupting the gardeners. But um, I was surrounded by gardeners as as a child. And my mother was an avid vegetable gardener. I don't remember having any interest in it until I moved into my own apartment. And, you know, I'm, I'm guessing probably had my first house plant by myself would have been my first experience of them, but have been since we bought our home out here 35 years ago, 36 years ago, I was bitten by the bug. Um, and then joining the staff at Ledoux certainly uh, added to that. So not a, not a green thumb as a child, but a, a full-blown gardening addict as an adult. Wonderful. And what are your home gardens like? Are you vegetable, ornamental, a combination? I am mostly shrub beds. I started out with annuals and perennials and really didn't have the time to manage a lot of the maintenance required in extensive flower beds. So I have a lot of shrubs and small trees and they're accented with perennials. I've discovered, as I think most people do when they have that third season of weeding midsummer, that the bigger and broader the shrubs you have in your garden, the less sun to create weeds. So that's made it that's made it more manageable for me. I will say, like most gardeners I know, everything grows by a couple of feet or yards every year. And as the shrubs grow, I'm not as good as maintaining the size of them as I should. So I usually just make the bed larger and add more perennials in front. So it I mentioned addiction. I think it is like that. It's you know, mm-hmm. Every, every July, I think maybe I'm done. And every April, I fall off a cliff again and find plants that I can't live without. So a, a good <laughs> habit, I suppose. Exactly. And I love that falling off a cliff analogy because, yeah, all of a sudden spring hits and it's spring fever and you're like, oh, yep. I could do this. Yes. Exactly. If you buy a car based on how many plants you can fit in the back of it, I think you're of this type. <laughs> And I, every time I haven't had a lot of cars in my life, but every time uh, since adulthood that I purchased a car, I've thought, how many plants can you fit in the back of that? 
Yeah, I think Subaru or somebody should take up that in the advertising campaign. Is- oh, yeah. Well, one of our sponsors here for our garden festival is a Subaru dealer. And the car that we have at the event is all staged with plants in the back of it. You can see people light up when they go by it. Yeah, they 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 get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they should advertise 51 gallon plants could fit in the back of this. <laughs> exactly. Not including the ones you have in your lap. Exactly. Or in the passenger seat or everywhere. (laughs) Exactly. Mm -hmm. So what was your professional background, Emily, that brought you to Ladue? What I guess most places like this have needed at one point in their life, my background is development. So I was doing development for a hospital in Baltimore City. And when I had my second child, I retired for a matter of a couple of months and um, started doing consulting, development consulting. And I was doing some down in Washington, D.C. and some in the Baltimore area. And one of my friends, a wonderful philanthropist who I'd worked with in in some of the hospital work that I'd done in Baltimore, um, had asked me to come out and meet with a few of the board members at Ladue. So this was 36 years ago. And I came in and met with them and uh, down in our cafe in the courtyard and had lunch with them. And like most development people could not control the urge to tell them exactly what they should do and how they could build on everything and all the opportunities. And within about two years, I was a member of their consulting committee and helping them with events and ended up eventually on the board and then sort of went backwards, retired from the board and took a staff position about five years later because they couldn't find somebody in surprise development. So fundraising brought me here. And certainly as the director of a place like that, I have the great opportunity to spend a lot of time with our funders. I think the reason I'm still here is number one, because of the people that are engaged at all levels of Ladue, just really fabulous plants people and and great philanthropists and great staff because the place is, particularly in the last couple of years, it's just, it's so therapeutic. It's a lot of things. It's beautiful. It's full of history. But uh, at the end of the day, it is, it's such an exceptional place to be able to just physically be in and call it work. Speaking of Ladue, and maybe a lot of our listeners are not familiar with it and may, might not have visited before, we should probably first orient where you are located. It's Moncton, Maryland, and that's mm-hmm. Baltimore County, I believe. We're actually Harford County. We're about a mile into Harford County. Mm-hmm. So we are 30 about 33 miles north of Baltimore City and about 15 miles south of the Pennsylvania line. So we're in Northern Maryland. Our address is Moncton, which is where you got the Baltimore County because Moncton is actually in Baltimore County, but we're in the Harford County side of Moncton. We are about 12 miles off of 95 and we're about 15 miles north of 695, which is the Baltimore Beltway. So we're out in what is what is considered the hunt country, Baltimore and Harford County's hunt country. And that's because this is a big area for people who do fox hunting. And horses. So Ladue Topiary Gardens is known as a world-renowned topiary garden. And let's talk a little bit about the history of it how it was established. It is open to the public, so we can talk about how a public could visit. And it's 22 acres. It's a historic garden as well. Mm -hmm. And we should maybe start with the gentleman who purchased the property and maybe why and what his plans for it were when he purchased it. Wonderful. So Harvey Ledoux lived on the North Shore of Long Island. His family had made a fortune in the leather industry. And to put that into some perspective, they created the leather straps that ran the machinery during the Industrial Revolution. So it's probably the equivalent of being the microchip creator during our our last evolution. He never worked. He traveled from very early, an early age with his family all over Europe. He spoke French, I believe, before he spoke English. He had one sister named Elise, and they spent their time in the North Shore of Long Island and were very deeply into equestrian sports, into carriage driving and into fox hunting and into competing in horse shows. He came down here to fox hunt because he felt like it was a little bit too overdeveloped or becoming too overdeveloped in the Long Island area. 
And he came down here, purchased this 250-acre property from the Scarf family, and it is adjoining the Elkridge Harford Hunt Club, where he was a master at one point. So he came down here looking for the equestrian sport and for fox hunting. But when he got here, he fixed up the house. He built a, a little beautiful cottage at the hunt club and lived there while he fixed up the house here. And then he sort of turned his eye to the farmland all around him and had an entire lifetime worth of images of gardens that he had been visiting with his family and on his own. And he just, I sort of picture his mind sort of melting into the ground and he created 22 acres of gardens characterized both specifically by topiary. And those gardens include 15 garden rooms. He has, and we have added since, and that, so that's 250 acres total and 22 of it are the gardens, the formal gardens themselves. And since his death, we have added a mile and a half long nature walk through this Harford County beautiful countryside that has really interesting and varied topography and, and plant selections. And then in 2014, we added a native butterfly house. So his stables are now the cafe and his garage is the gift shop and the historic house is open for tours and the gardens are open six days a week. So he had said towards the end of his life, he wanted, he was trying desperately to give the gardens to someone to take care of. And a few of his very dear friends took this place over and they took money into, you know, cigarette boxes at the entrance at little card tables. And they held it all together. And it is now, we now see 50,000 visitors a year. And I think he's, it's sort of a dream realized of his. And as I said before, with COVID happening, such the, the importance of this kind of sort of wonderful sacred spaces is really become apparent with so much stress in people's lives. So it's been mm -hmm. a real privilege to be affiliated with it, particularly over the last few years. And you mentioned being closed one day a week, which I think is Wednesdays, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And that's been very helpful for just lawn maintenance. It's it's frustrating to come visit a beautiful garden and have to get out of the way of the lawn. <laughs> Yes. And I would say much more peaceful and uh, relaxing experience without that. And I was going to say that you're also closed for a time during the winter, correct? We are. So our official year, which is really dictated by the gardens, we are open from April 1st to October 31st. We close again to the public in October and we prepare for a Christmas open house, which we have either not had or had a small version of the last few years, we are going to be bringing it back this this December. So we can hope to have our, our gatherings in December here again, where there are arrangements made from uh, materials from the gardens and the house is decorated by garden clubs and local designers. It's spectacular. And we're thinking about adding some lights additional lighting, outdoor lighting to this year's event. So we're looking forward to that. Excellent. And I know Ladue is not that well known, even in our own region, but it's been recognized with prestigious awards from tourism companies, and it's been named the most outstanding topiary garden in America by the Garden Club of America and by Architectural Digest, named it 10 incredible topiary gardens around the world. So we're not just talking in North America, but all around the world. Yep. Yeah, we are. I, do, I like to think of it as in a community that are very aware of our larger, fabulous garden neighbors like Longwood. We are a little garden gem. Now, 22 acres for me would be an unbearably large garden gem on a personal level, but compared to the scope of some of the public gardens that people have visited, this one is is unique in that it's relatively it's relatively compact and in that 22 acres to have 15 different garden rooms featuring different plant material, different colors. I, I think it's I, a gem is a good way, good way to describe it, I think. Mm -hmm. And the grounds are very easily walkable and doable in a day, you know, breaking it up with maybe a lunch or brunch at the cafe in between the rooms that you refer to and the themed areas. So they're either by the color of the plants. So a white room, a yellow room, a red room, or they're by 
another theme by the plants themselves. Can you walk us through some of those rooms? Correct. Um, we have our most recently restored garden and we pay significant attention to uh, Harvey Ledoux's design intent because he was quite brilliant. He had a, he had a great eye and was a, was very familiar with plant material and garden spaces. Actually, indoor and outdoor spaces. He was just very gifted visually. We just restored the woodland garden, which is the garden right in front of the house. That is all woodland plants. And when we did that restoration this year, bringing it back to his original design intent, using a checkerboard pattern and there are QR codes in every garden now. So when you come to visit, you can scan the code and there's a history tour in those QR codes. So visitors will be able to see images of what the garden did look like in the past and what we were trying to get back to. Hmm. But that's woodland in character. So it's not large swaths of any one sun-loving plant. It's a wonderful collection of hellebores and a variety of different ferns. We have a Victorian garden, which is then based on the Victorian theme. And that changes color, but it's often a variety of rich, luscious pinks and deep purples. We have a rose garden and an iris garden. So both of them feature those plants. And then the croquet court, which would be the only one that is specific to an activity or a sport. Um, he used to have a croquet court on the property at the beginning of his time here. It was a tennis court. And as he aged and tennis became less appealing, he changed it to a croquet court. And uh, visitors can go by and see where the croquet used to take place. But that's, yeah, that's pretty much it. Plant material, a color of plant, and in the one case with the croquet court, a, a sport reference to something that was very much a part of his leisure time when he was here. The plantings, you're incorporating new as well as historic plantings, correct? You're not making it a, a second in time where he had lived there. Exactly. And there are a lot of reasons for that. We are, our first thing is the commitment to design intent, which I mentioned before being so important. So what was the the size, the shape, the color, the leaf size of the plant that we've just lost. What is, and the first question we would have, what is a good horticulturally reasonable and native option? If there's not a, you know, we want the right plant in the place so that we have something that is going to be less vulnerable to disease because it's not stressed. We also don't want to introduce or maintain invasives in the garden. So whenever we lose a plant, we do go through that test in our mind. We do have a lot of non-natives on the property. What we try to avoid are non-native invasives, and we do try to select natives whenever we can. And that is a everyday conversation, particularly after you know big storms when we have what we like to think of as opportunities, but when we have those big nuisance losses of plant material, we have to make decisions about what he had originally and what mm -hmm. the purpose of that plant was in the design and then how we can replicate that true to the design, but horticulturally um, in a responsible way. So that does bring us to the topic of the show, which is topiary itself. And maybe we should define topiary. It's such a funny word mm -hmm. um, and a little bit of the history of it and why Harvey Ledoux wanted it on his property there. So, and this is interesting, Kathy, because when I knew what I was going to speak to you, I did talk to my topiary experts because I am not the topiary expert in terms of maintaining them. I know all about them, but it is really an art to be able to manage the care of these. And for our purposes, topiary is the shaping of living trees and shrubs. So you will see in places, and we do it as well, we have frames that we fill with sphagnum moss and wrap with green moss to create characters in the gardens for different events and programs. I think we have a, we have a horse and we have a few people. We may have a dog. I can't remember. We have a lot of frames that will, that will fill with moss and, and wrap with moss. Um, and we do not consider those topiaries. We consider topiary shaping of live plant material. So Ledoux, as I said, he was a fox hunter, and there is a reference in his notes about being out with the hunt in England and seeing a very cleverly done hound that was shaped on the top of a hedge and a property. He was probably jumping over the hedge on horseback, but he had been out fox hunting and saw this hound. And I think he was just 
startled by how sort of whimsical it was and it stuck with him for his entire life and when he came down here I you know it was one of his driving forces behind this garden was to feature this element that he thought was so fun and there are over a hundred of them in the gardens at Ladue. For the, the plant material you're using for the topiary on site are they're all the same type of shrub or do they vary throughout the different garden rooms? They they do vary and they vary for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, there many of them are the plants he originally planted. So we're, we're caring for his original topiaries, particularly a lot of the hemlock. And when I say topiary, some of these things are just walls, large hedges, and I mean, 22 foot hedges um, with windows cut into them in some cases, or swags carved into them. Some are just plain walls. Others are animals or geometric shapes. So we worked with the plant material and have tried to maintain the plant material he had originally in many cases, um, mostly hemlock and taxus. Um, we also work with privet. Uh, privet is an invasive plant, so we have to be very attentive about pruning it religiously so that it can't set seed. Tighter leaf hollies can also be used for topiary, and we have a few of them on the property. We have a few boxwoods, but surprisingly not that many. I think boxwoods are what people immediately go to when they think of sort of English gardens. There has been a horrible blight with boxwoods recently, so personally I'm glad that we weren't that dependent on them for for the topiary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen so much of the boxwood in our area looking... Uh, I guess we would call it dead inside <laughs> and, yeah. and opened yeah. up. Yeah. yeah. And we did a past episode talking about boxwood and boxwood care and, and touched a little bit about topiary but and shaping, but that's a whole different art. So maybe we could start with if you're a homeowner who just wanted to add a little bit of topiary to your landscape, what would you start with and what shape maybe? So Phil Croc. Uh, has been caring for the topiary at Ledoux for this year is his 41st year. So my guess is that Phil is probably one of the best versed and experienced topiary artists in the country, if not up there in legions with the with world experts on it. Mm -hmm. And he makes this look profoundly easy. The whole crew joins him at different times of the year to care for the extensive topiary here. And Abby Evans is coming up behind him as the person that manages it. So when you when you sit there and get down to the bottom of what they do and what they are working with on a daily basis and, and what they recommend, their number one guiding word is patience. You cut a topiary to grow into its shape. And I that's a very important distinction. Edward Scissorhands had the great advantage of Hollywood behind him. So he would sharpen up his fingers <laughs> and get in front of a large hedge and he would cut it down to look exactly what it would look like. And plants mm -hmm. people know that if you take a large plant and cut it to a shape, there's going to be a little bit of the plant still visible, but the rest of it's just going to be holes and skeleton and, and stems. So exactly. oftentimes if you have the option of not having any kind of guide for the shape of the plant you might want. You could look even in that that part of the nursery where they've put the things that they've given up on. That's where I have found the plant that I've tried topiary on. And maybe it looks a little bit like something in its pot there and you could take it home and you could figure out what it is that you're envisioning and look at it a little bit and cut it back to what could grow into that shape. So it's not, uh, photographs are very important, good clippers and shears, and our staff use electric shears, but they also use the hand shears that are advertised as both plant and sheep shears. You know, you hold them from the base and they have a spring load and then two large scissors that come together because you're not trying to cut a whole bunch of little pieces that line, well, you are trying to cut a whole bunch of pieces of a plant that line up. So the longer scissors are hmm. very helpful for the flat areas. The safest thing to do from the very beginning would be just a very simple shape, maybe even a round topiary. I had mentioned boxwood and you and I were talking about the blight. One thing that I've noticed in my garden at home, and we've had the same experience out um, in the courtyard outside my office, is that boxwoods don't seem to suffer from the blight when they're in containers. 
So I don't know enough about this to know that it's sorrel born, but I'm guessing that it probably is. You can work with a boxwood. That's probably the easiest thing to shape into a very round shape to start. It's very satisfying to have that success with the first with the first topiary you do. The minute you finish it and you've sheared it and it's a perfectly round shape, you are going to want to go cut a couple of holes into that round shape because you want light to be able to get inside of the topiary. Our topiary people are always telling me that's the hardest part of what they do is that they cut this perfect shape and then they gouge it a little bit to allow light into the inside of the plant. So it's continually regenerating from the inside. Yeah, I would imagine you want this perfect finish and then you kind of have to mess it up a little bit. It kind of sounds almost like what hairdressers do. You know, you have the perfect fringe and then you kind of cut into it a little bit for movement. Oh, yeah. You know, it's funny you say that. There's a new hedger that they're using. I can never remember the name of it, but it but it has it's a clipper that just has three clippers in the front of it. It looks like a dog grooming tool. Um, I think it's called a shrubber. It's battery operated. It's one of the one of the Ryobi materials that we use, which we we love because they're quiet. So when you're visiting the gardens, it's not disruptive to listen to all the noise of the of the electric equipment. Mm-hmm. But this thing, when you watch them cut with these, it just looks how like somebody that's trimming a horse or a dog. It's really remarkable. They're sort of cutting into it. It allows them to open plant material up. But I do think that the basic concept of patience and being willing to realize that to do anything complex, you are going to take it down to its skeleton first and let it grow back into fill its shape. So the the immediate satisfaction, if that is something that you need to keep engaged and happy, don't do topiary. Yeah. And it's obviously not overnight and but it's like sculpting. It know, is. Using but using a living plant material. So you're kind of erasing everything that's there except for the sphere, you in your example of a, a boxwood ball, and then cutting it back. And then there's the ongoing maintenance. How often do the topiary at Ledoux get trimmed back? Is it a twice a year, or a monthly? It, it depends on the plant material. Um, mm-hmm. And not only does it depend on the plant material, um, it depends on the the plant's growth habit, but also its needs. So years ago, there was a creature called woolly adelgid that arrived and was torturous to hemlock. Mm -hmm. Some of the hemlock at Ledoux were replaced because the plants were already stressed enough by being sheared all the time. And then this critter comes along that was damaging them and they they really couldn't survive it. So a couple of things happened. Number one, I believe Longwood came up with a dormant oil, very low profile, not chemically you know, dangerous, dormant oil spray to use to back down the woolly adelgid. And we realized that we had a responsibility to figure out how to lower the amount of stress we were putting the plants under. So that beautiful green new growth that comes up on the hemlock hedge that bright green, cheerful stuff. It's not a sharp line any longer. They become fuzzy. We call it, I call it the fuzzy season. Some visitors don't like it. They think they write, <laughs> they write comments on TripAdvisor that our topiary were fuzzy. But when that growth comes up, one of its main goals is to provide nutrients and feed the plant. So we have to wait for that to harden off before we can prune them. So they do have a substantial fuzzy season. And then usually by the end of August, beginning of September, the hemlock can be sheared. The taxis that the hedges in the front hunt scene are of, the the hunt scene where the horses are jumping over the fences and chasing the hounds and the fox, those are all taxis and they can be trimmed earlier because they leaf out earlier and harden off. And privet, with the exception of a couple of mites, Privet is just tolerant of just about anything. So, which is good because in trying to control the set of seeds and the blooming, we prune that that back pretty consistently. So it's really number one based on the plant's needs because a stressed plant is not going to be a long-lived plant. And I would say maybe the taxes could be twice a year, but everything is for the most part once a year. Yeah. And I would assume that a home gardener doing it themselves, it's kind of tempting to do it all the time. Like when Mm -hmm. you see one sprig stick out in one direction or one another, 
or to skip it all together. You're like, uh, it'll, it'll maintain its shape and then you've lost it again. I'm going to have to come back in. So I have a few myrtles at home mm -hmm. and I cut them back all the time, but they grow so fast. I mean, taxis and hemlock do not grow like the myrtles that you'll see at, at every plant store that are already shaped into the three balls. And they, they are tough as nails. They're a wonderful little bring it home immediate topiary element. You can drop it into a container on your patio and they do, they get big and puffy pretty quickly and you can hand clip them back to their original shape that, you know, it's not too much of a commitment and it. That's a great starter plant, a container plant versus something in the gardens. I agree. And I think you could do like a whole little lineup maybe. Mm -hmm. of different shapes and things to experiment with while while you're learning the art of topiary and you had mentioned some of the tools that your gardeners use there i'm imagining that they need to be very sharp and maintained do you have your own tool shop and sharpener on site oh yes we're very fortunate we we built a maintenance building for our long suffering court staff about eight years ago. They used to work out of a old chicken coop, which was our garage shop area with a wood stove for heat in the winter. I think back on it now and I can't manage <laughs> the thought that they were in those circumstances, but now they're in a modern bu building. It's fabulous because we have space now to store all of our equipment, which lasts a lot longer if it's in you know an area undercover, including tractors and things like that. And we have both a metal shop and a wood shop. So there's a portion of the winter that's spent bringing all the tools uh, up to snuff. And Phil, um, who I mentioned earlier, has led several classes here. We have something called In the Garden Series. And our In the Garden Series are times where we invite members and visitors in. And you can sign up for them. I think there's a small fee. And people can spend a, a good part of a morning with the garden staff while they do something. And one of those items is tool care. And boy, if you're like me, I mean, I have rusted tools everywhere. It's so important and you can do so much damage to plants if you don't have sharp blades, particularly topiary can look awful after the after being trimmed. Yeah, I can imagine that that is a popular workshop because there are so many of us have, who have let our some of our older but really good tools mm -hmm. uh, go to rust or they're just dull. And yeah, they're going to damage any plants, much less topiary for working on. And you know, thinking of this and thinking of bonsai, we this is a full-time, year-round, somewhat anxious-filled at times job for our Hort staff to manage a legacy like this. But for a homeowner, particularly with a smaller um, topiary, it, it can really be very meditative. You know, if, the, if you know, those little tiny small snips that you use, uh, you know, flower snips, you know, nice quiet afternoon thing to sort of center you a little bit. So starting out with a, with a small houseplant topiary, which we all see, particularly around the holidays, I, I highly recommend that. That's a, that's, that's a great way to sort of stay, particularly in the wintertime too, in, in a little bit in touch with nature in your garden. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'm thinking of some of those like kind of pyramidical rosemary plants. Yep. And yep. those could be trained easily. And then there are some small potted ones, even ivies that can be sheared or shaped as a house plant and trained mm -hmm. that way. Yep, exactly. And there, you know, it's a fun, it, it, all house plants, I think, have to there's a special attention that has to be paid to them in the winter time when your heat comes on in terms of how quickly they dry out but otherwise a lovely a lovely addition to the house when everything outside is all beige and you know it's a way to be creatively expressive in your garden as well so one of the most impactful things when you arrive at ledoux is that hunter on horseback and the fox mm -hmm. and the hounds all created out of topiary and it's such an iconic image and something that people, you know, want to create just a small part of that, maybe just a little fox in their own garden or maybe a chicken or some, some other shape that would be fun to add to your own gardenscape. Exactly. And I think that's the perfect case. And, and I'm sure anyone who's listening to this is probably a nursery stalker, but you will see in different plant very easily in junipers 
a lot of these things tell you what they want to be before you even pick up a pair of pruners. So for those more complicated things like a, a fox or a dog, you know, you may discover that you you see something that already has, is already growing towards that already, which makes it a little bit easier. Yeah. And I've seen people make a series of round shrubs into a large caterpillar. That's mm-hmm. always a, a fun one to do if you've already got the start of that in a row. And also, you know, of course, there's the little lollipops and pyramids and other fun geometric images you could create in your own garden. And that was reminding me of um, one of their famous modern contemporary topiary gardens, which is Pearl Fryer down in South, South Carolina. Are you familiar with him? I am very familiar. I actually have followed Pearl's garden on Facebook now, and we have developed a friendship with Mike Gibson, who... Uh, your listeners might know Mike as the young guy who got a grant and went in as the uh, topiary gardener in residence to help Pearl in the last year or so pull his gardens you know, back up to the level that he had hoped they would be. And uh, that's just a spectacular place. And that is just, just a big old love garden. I mean, Pearl just loved the enthusiasm he had for creating those topiary reminds me a little bit of some of the photographs I've seen of Ledoux in the early years where you know, he would leave notes in his journal saying, you know, I clipped for eight and a half hours today. Just loved it. Just had the best time. And Pearl's gardens are fabulous. I have not been down to see them yet, but fortunately they're so popular now you can see a lot if you Google him. Mm-hmm. And if you haven't seen it before, the documentary, A Man Named Pearl, that came out in 2006, is really inspiring and just wonderful and all about this self-taught topiary artist, Pearl Fryer, and what he did. And he just, one day he got out some shears and he said, that looks like, hmm, that could be something. And <laughs> then it just, you know, literally, no pun intended, grew and grew and grew to, you know, be his whole property property is a topiary garden. Yep. And exactly. But think of what you just said. He said, that looks like, you know, the plant told him. Mm-hmm. And exactly. then they all started telling him, I don't think that there was a, a shrub in his community that didn't get shaped at one point. <laughs> yeah. I think he just felt this irresistible need to do so. And that is the art part of it. So yeah. it's yeah. really you know, it's not maintenance that you're doing where you could just be shearing and, and sculpting hedges to a certain shape, but you're actually executing a vision that is in within yourself. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that, that our staff here have this great uh, commitment and sense of sort of dedication to things. I was watching Phil the other day um, shape the camel in front of the barn, and it's just perfect. I mean, it's got cloven hoofs. It's, what is a dromedary? What has one hump? It's just, you know, they research, they had pictures up to make sure they're refining it. And the animals have changed a little bit. The uh, Ledoux's hounds were very skinny. It looked like he never fed them. They have thickened up quite a bit. They're, they're more abundantly fed hounds these days. <laughs> but still, you know, and, and, and the big sort of frightening question of, oh, what if we lose one? You know, we have, there's a, an ode to a Thomas More sculpture that Ledoux did on the property and, and it died and it was replanted. And I think it would be difficult for people to tell what's there now compared to what he had. So um, the ultimate fear with this kind of thing with all gardeners is it might die and you just start again. Yeah. And it's replaceable, which is great to hear because it grows. It's not, you know, a piece of glass art that just shatters and it's exactly. gone forever. But of course, you also have the photos and videos that people have taken over the decades and the differences. And I was going to actually ask about the thickening of the horse and rider and hounds because looking at historic photos it is they are a little leaner and I would think that is an evolution too in topiary that it's a more fuller look now but also as the decades go by the plants thicken up in, by themselves well they do but I can tell the I can tell who was on staff if I look at photographs of those hounds because Tim treated them one way and Chris treated them another and the staff that are working on them now treat them differently. So the personality of the artist that's working on them shows up in the end product. They, you know, everybody has a, has a unique interpretation. They've always been hounds. Hmm. They've just been hounds on very different diets. 
<laughs> yeah. And I think that's great that the personal touch really shows through for those. And one of the parts of a lot of the animals is usually where they meet the ground. Uh, mm -hmm. Their feet or legs can be the, the skinniest or thinnest part of the topiary creatures. Mm -hmm. Are those especially hard to maintain those underneath and narrow areas? You know what? It's interesting that you ask about that because uh, I don't. And once again, I'm not caring for the topiary every day, but I don't think about those with one exception. Any t we, we have a small it's almost invisible in photographs, little black chain link fence around the hunt scene in the front, only to remind people of how fragile those are, mm -hmm. because those just disappear. I mean, you almost, when you take a photograph, you almost see the dog sort of running above the ground. You don't see the stems at all. But if someone climbs on top of one of them, that's when they're vulnerable. If there's extra weight added to the topiaries, that's certainly where they can snap. And we did years ago have someone um broke i think it's the reason the fence is around them now broke the tail on one of the hounds by sitting on it and they were very apologetic apologetic afterwards i think they just got caught up in the moment and the head of gardens at the time bent the tail back up and sort of aligned the cadmium and they put a stainless steel screw through it and it's continued to grow it's been fine but that's the real vulnerability um, plant material a tree losing a large limb and falling on it or mm -hmm. a person accidentally bumping it the garden staff are just completely trained from day one about using equipment near them i can't imagine what it would feel like to be the person that mowed over one of them. <laughs> it would not be a good day no <laughs> never yeah. happened in my time and i'm knocking on wood <laughs> And good to know. And I guess a final question would be about the weather. So we talked about, mm -hmm. you know, a tree branch could fall on something if it was under something, but most of them are out in full sun um, with nothing above them. But I imagine they are also susceptible to ice storms and hail mm -hmm. and other acts of nature. Mm -hmm. Do you burlap and, and wrap them in the wintertime or do any other precautions? We do nothing. And I'll tell you, in part, we do nothing because there's just so much that we would have to do that it's almost overwhelming. I have been here for 20 years in this job, and I remember maybe 12 years ago, 15 years ago, we had one winter where there was a total of 82 inches of snow. It was two different snowstorms, but cold enough between the two that the snow didn't really melt much. Mm -hmm. And the kind of snow that it is makes a difference. If it's a light filtery snow and it goes down, once again, important to leave those holes and those openings in the plant material, it filters down between the branches and then, you know, raises up as the snow gets deeper. That's fine. But if you get the kind of snow that comes down fast and wet and it creates a crust on the top of the topiary and then you get 40 inches of snow on top of that, when everything melts, you can have a lot of stuff, particularly the larger hedges, um, sort of split open or lying on the ground. They, because of that attention to allowing air and snow into the plant, I really can't remember many years of pieces of topiary bending and breaking off of anything. Mm. But I have seen springs where it's taken them a while to get their shape back again. Um, and there is a term that I'm not going to remember right now that is the reason that plants grow up. And it's actually all plants have this habit of growing up towards the sky and up towards the sun. And there's actually a term for it. So a plant that's laid down by the snow in the winter time, given that it's not damaged and the weight comes off of it should correct. And we see that every year. The areas where we have holes in topiary and breakage are more related to disease. And some of these topiaries are almost 100 years old. Some of them are way over 100 years old. So occasionally you do have to do a replacement. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I remember that winter where it was just one heavy wet snow and then three days later, another one right on top of several feet. And it just laid down a lot of the, the pine trees and people's hedges was were just split in half. So that was a lot of damage. Oh, yeah. And we do not have a lot of white pines in the gardens. Mm. I would love to think that's by design because they're the killers. They will, they'll let loose with everything if they get too much weight on them in the winter. And they're also, with the recent very bad storm we had out here, they're very um, susceptible to 
to win. But the no, it's been I have been amazed, and I'm you know I'm tempting fate here by saying this, but for the most part, if you're patient and you don't try to rush it, you could go in and try to shake a lot of snow off of a plant right away. But if it pops back too fast, it could be just as damaging. Mm-hmm. So just sort of being hopeful and and waiting for the thaw has has worked best for us. We're we're struggle a little bit now, like everybody does, with this sort of cold, drier winters, and those aren't good for anything because you will get leaf burn. Mm-hmm. in winters like that. You get a little bit of snow on the ground, very dry and cold, and the reflection can do burn. I, the, the, the deeper snow is a little bit better for gardens, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if there's like a constant snow cover on the ground, that that's actually an insulating factor versus that. Do you do any spraying for some of the evergreens to prevent that leaf burn, like with a horticultural oil? I, You know, we just have so many. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to say no, because there may be some, maybe some of the boxwood in the front, in the front um, courtyard, but I don't, I actually don't think that we do. We do some, we try to really limit our use of chemicals on the property, but we mm-hmm. do some treatment. We do the door, dormant oil treatment for uh, the woolly adelgids still, because they return every year. We don't do anything for any of the plant material for June bugs, because they, I mean, not June bugs, Japanese beetles, because they just run their course. And we will look for mites and other things that can be damaging to evergreens. But, you know, the, the really important thing is to keep them as healthy as possible. And then they, they, they can struggle with more adversity if they're healthier plants. Now we do when we do our, oh, I'm sorry, when we do our green sale in the wintertime and we cut greens and make arrangements and wreaths, we spray all of that with that anti-desiccant. All, all cut plants, but not the not the live one. That would be a good tip for preparing those winter greens. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you, Emily, for sharing all of this and for indulging us in the art of topiary. How would listeners get in touch with you and learn more about Ledoux? They can reach out. Well, first of all, delighted to talk to you. Always, Kathy. We love plant people here. It's a, a fun and refreshing group of enthusiastic people, and we, we love to see them here, and we love to talk to them on the radio. You can reach me at our webpage, Ledoux Gardens with an S dot com, or Facebook, and we do interact on our Facebook page, I guess, through the messenger, I think, regularly. So if you get in touch with me through that, I will get back to you. Great. And we should probably point out, since a lot of people are listening to it and might not have a pad or paper, that Ledoux is L-A-D-E-W. Yes, L-A-D-E-W gardens.com. And we're open Thursdays through Tuesdays from nine to four. And Mm -hmm. um, we'd love to see anybody who would love to see us. Thank you again, Emily. Thank you, Kathy. Take care. Nasturtium plant profile. Nasturtium, tropaeolum species, is an annual flower that is often grown in vegetable gardens as well as in mixed flower containers. There are trailing nasturtiums that are vining types that will need trellises or supports, and bush-type nasturtiums that grow in a more compact mound. They are native to Central and South America. Depending on the variety you choose, the flowers either bloom in bright, fiery tones or muted peaches and butter yellows. The leaves are round and usually deep green. Nasturtium can act as a trap crop in your edible garden drawing away aphids from other vulnerable plants. They are also attractive to pollinators and are visited by bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. Nasturtium are easy to grow from seed. Just soak the seeds overnight and then direct sow them in the ground or a container after the last spring frost has passed. They like growing in lean soils and do not need any fertilizers. The soil should be well draining and the location must be in full sun for best flower production. The only care they need is regular watering, but not too much water as they don't like overly moist soils. Nasturtiums are edible. The leaves and flowers have a peppery sharp taste. They are often used as a colorful garnish in salads. The large seed pods can also be pickled and used like capers. To do this, Harvest the seed pods before they harden. Once they harden, you can collect the seeds to plant next year. Nasturtium, you can grow that.
What's new in the garden this week? Well, in all this heat, my zonal geraniums and annual begonias are going and going and going, and I have to give them their props. Over at the community garden, we're growing biquinho peppers, which are a Brazilian cultivar. They feature tiny little teardrop-shaped pods of yellow and red. They're kind of mild. I wouldn't describe them as very hot, but they are adorable. And the name literally translates as little beak. In the local gardening world, some September events you should put on your calendar and plan to attend include the Urban Tree Summit 2022, co-produced by Montgomery Parks and Casey Trees. You can find out more about that and register online at caseytrees.org backslash urban-tree-summit-2022. Uh, they have a half day of virtual sessions on Wednesday, September 7th, and then a few field session days on following days throughout September. Another local event to put on your calendar is the Family Fall Festival at Green Spring Gardens in Annandale, Virginia. And that is on Saturday, September 17th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. I have a booth there and would love to see you there as well. And on that same day in the evening is a benefit for the American Horticultural Society's 100th Anniversary Gala, a great American garden party, it is named. And again, that's Saturday, September 17th at 6.30 p.m. And they're celebrating a century of impact in the beautiful gardens and incomparable landscapes of historic River Farm in Alexandria, Virginia. You can go online at AHS's website to become a sponsor or purchase your tickets to that wonderful event. Happy gardening! In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jensen Terry Spade, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at amazon.com or bookshop.org. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine. 